morning, everyone. Um, uh, Liz, I'm Dale Morris, the city's chief resilience officer. Um, came to the city about 15 months ago, um, and quite happily, I look around and I see and know most people after a, after quite some time. Um, and I'm uh, just enjoying the heck out of myself here in Charleston. We have a lot of problems. We have a lot of opportunities. And our natural systems here um, are just beautiful. Um, and they can help us deal with the city's resiliency. And i um, been happy to be part with Liz um, and Nicole and all the other organizing th team partners to organize the Nature Based Exchanges. Um, this is very important to me. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm working with on an Army Corps project and with other folks um, looking at natural and nature based features within the Army Corps of Engineers, BCA, which is real tricky because it prioritizes only structures. But we are trying to work with the Army Corps since 2014 when they got the mandate from Congress to start to incorporate more natural nature based features into their suite of projects. And um, there's another workshop in two weeks in DC with OMB. And if OMB starts to get involved, I think things are moving along. The OMB, for you all who don't know, that's the, the Federal Office of Management and Budget. They write all the regulations. So maybe something good is going to happen. Um, so we have just a wonderful panel here. Liz asked me to come in and do this. Um, I'm an economist by background and training. So I get this stuff, but I've moved over to the water side uh, 20 years ago. We have a great panel with, with Tom Murray and Keith, Keith Redling and Mark Belton and uh, Kate Schaefer. I didn't want to read the resumes. I summarized and cut and pasted there behind them so you can see how smart this panel is. And they have a certainly sort of distinct uh, uh, they have distinct backgrounds, and so I think we can pull a lot of information from them. But just some, just some background comments or framing from my side. You know, public infrastructure spending in the U.S. is what we're talking about. Infrastructure, public infrastructure spending in the U.S. is really on a 40-year decline. It started in the 80s, and it's been gone down relative to capital and needed capital, some capital protection thereof, right? Transportation funding has really been done the best of all um, sort of infra infrastructure spending over the last number of years. But if you look at our public transportation and our bridges, not very good. Um, and some of the other stuff we're worried about, IT is doing okay, but um, water quality, water quantity, um, flood protection, elect electricity, generation, transmission, you know, grid health, they're not doing so well, and O and M of all of that is really bad. Operations and maintenance. So we have this big challenge in here. So while we're trying to gather more funding at the local level for this kind of good stuff, we're in a hyper competitive environment. So that's great. But there's wonderful recent push of federal money coming out, ARPA and IIJA and IRA, and this is all it's a lot of good stuff here for climate mit mitigation and adaptation and uh, flood and heat and all that. It's wonderful. Um, and with a focus on environmental justice, now we have a different opportunity with Justice 40. There is an opportunity here for us. The good thing is, uh, Nifwith just said, and you hear from others, BRIC is around, all this federal money is around. It's around for at least five or 10 years because we can't absorb this amount of money in the economy that the federal government's pushing out in a year, so it's around. So if you're not ready this year, get ready for next year. Um, federal funding, however, for localities, because we're focused here, it's tricky for states and localities because um, the uptake will be suboptimal. And the uptake of that federal money will be sub suboptimal either because of capacity issues. The smallest cities don't have the capacity, so they don't apply for this, and they may have the highest need, so they don't get it. And New York City has 25 grant writers, and guess who gets all the money, right? So this is a real problem for us. So the uptake is, is suboptimal for localities. And then some of the localities who need it may not have the political will or the fiscal space to absorb this money. So it's tricky because there's a match, right? So there's a match for a lot of these projects. So even though this money's out there, localities are going to have a harder time. It's not sort of one-to-one, -one and we're all happy. It's really tricky. Um, talking about the funding resources, so, you know, economists, you can tax and spend, you can borrow, borrow and spend, or if you're a government, you can mandate and have others spend to accomplish goals, right? So this is general, uh, general nature of this, but there's a secret society sort of language, code language that exists 
amongst people dealing with local finance. You know, EIBs and TIFs and MIDs and BIDs and CIBs for CIPs and whatever. It just goes on and on and on. And it's really tricky for consultants and project managers and scientists and EJ communities to think, how do we get hold of this money? So we have to sort of penetrate this issue. Um, bonding is really something that is used long term, sort of stormwater fees, utility fees is something that provides durable, durable funding over a longer term. Um, general revenues, they get project specific issues, project specifics subject to the political whim and the fiscal space. That's not very good for infrastructure investment because infrastructure investment occurs over a long period of time. So there are challenges for communities because you have really you can tax and spend or you can borrow and spend right, in localities, it's important. But there's really good news, so just an example on the green bond funding, right, so on the, on the financing side, um, the ESG pr principles were released in 2014, the market at that point was tiny, about $28 billion nation, or worldwide. By this year, um, there's $1.1 trillion of issuance, and my math tells me that's a 3,500% increase in issuance. And then the quality and the breadth of all this issuance from, from the issuer, from the sector, from the focus, from the currency, it's just exploded. So there's a bunch of money now sort of coming around, becoming available in addition to the federal push, right? Resilience bonds are a new type of bonds, really encouraging. They oversubscribed in Europe. This is a pay for pay kind of thing where the insurance industry is going to invest money into projects so you help them buy down the risk and the premium the cost savings come back into the city so they can fund projects to buy down that risk. So it's really encouraging. There's some really good uh, sort of happy news um, around after Hurricane Harvey 2017, Harris County, which is Houston sits in Harris County, approved overwhelmingly a $2.5 billion bond for flood risk mitigation. And a lot of that money is going to develop green infrastructure solutions. So this is good. Last week, New York City, um, the New York State, uh, a $4.2 billion environmental bond was approved, I think close to 60% voter approval, $1.5 billion to mitigate climate change impacts, $1 billion, $1.1 for restoration and flood risk reduction, six fifty dollars for land conservation and recreation, and six, another six fifty dollars for water quality and resilient infrastructure. So there's a bunch of money floating around out there, guys, and how do we get hold of this, right? One of the challenges we have, and it was just touched upon by the first speaker, we, we all have, we have these goofy BCAs, right? <clears throat> and for the federal government, and I can't harp on this enough, the federal government, EPA has their own BCA, and FEMA has its own BCA, and HUD has its own BCA, and Army Corps has its own BCA. It is really difficult and really inefficient for the time needed to, to go through these BCAs. And we need to, we need to work on that. Problem with most of the BCAs, notwithstanding FEMA's tremendous improvement, is that the BCAs have screens when they look at the alternatives. So, so many natural and nature-based uh, approaches to infrastructure, or risk, risk reduction, or benefit creation, they get screened out in the first part of the alternative selection, or the, the alternative review. So, this is a real big challenge for the economic science quantify benefits and get those benefits in there so that the projects don't get screened away. Projects that have natural nature-based features or environmental benefit or ecosystem services benefits or environmental justice benefits, we don't screen those out. And it's a real challenge and we need to keep working on that. So with that, I um, just want to say welcome to the panel and just the first question. So I'll introduce yourself and then talk a little bit you know, from your experience and expertise with localities is there any creativity going on here to get money, to get financing or funding, successful projects done with natural nature-based features or green infrastructure, whatever the appropriate term we're using is? How, do you, how are you looking at this? What are the success stories? What are, we, are we happy with this? So. Uh, well, I can start. I'm Keith Redling. Uh, I'm an executive vice president with Raftellis. We're a financial consulting firm focused primarily on local government finance. And um, I guess what I would say is, you know, we're talking about internal funding opportunities here that, that foundationally maybe just set the stage. 
the, the major sources of internal funding are going to be general fund dollars from ad valorem tax revenue or fee revenues from some kind of fee. And you could have an environmental fee, you could have a fee for solid waste, recycling, water and sewer, electricity, gas. The one that I work on the most is stormwater. And those fee revenues are set aside and have to be used for the intended purpose. So if you have a water and sewer revenue fund, you can't buy police cars with that money. General fund dollars, you can do anything with. So, so first off, kind of fee versus tax revenue and significant implications on who the payer is. So if you think about tax revenues used to fund a lot of general government operations, the folks who are paying the most taxes are the folks who own the most valuable things that are taxable. And that may or may not correlate very well with the demand they place on the local government for a service. So if I were to fund, for example, water and sewer with taxes, uh, people who own big fancy things might pay a lot for water and sewer and it may not have much to do with how much water they drink or how much sewage they generate. Fee fund, but, but general tax revenues tend to be ability to pay, meaning people who pay more taxes have the ability to do so or they would unload some of their taxable things. On the revenue funding side, uh, there's a rate structure that theoretically should correlate more with the demand that a rate payer places on the local government for a service. And so we would expect that if we're funding water and sewer, it might have to do with how much water you use. If we're funding stormwater, the thing I know more about, it may have a lot to do with runoff generation, peak runoff rate, pollution, nutrients in the water, and those things are caused by different things and they might steer you to different rate structures. So I'll, I'll leave it there because everybody needs to weigh in, but foundationally, internal funding, fee or tax, pay now or pay later, and that's am I gonna pay cash or am I gonna debt finance this with some kind of bond? So. Thanks, Keith. Um, hi, I'm Mark Belton. I'm a, a project partner with Throw Environmental. You heard from Joanne Throw on the first panel earlier today, but I'm also the county administrator in Charles County, Maryland. Charles County is in Southern Maryland, and it's a count jurisdiction of about 175,000 people, um, a suburb in, to a large extent of Washington, D.C. So we've got a lot of people that travel to work to the, to the nation's capital. And I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about a, an organizational innovation that our county has undertaken um, called a Resilience Authority. And what it basically is, is a nonprofit organization that our board of county commissioners, our county is run by a five member board. They created this nonprofit organization, um, government instrumentality called a resilience authority, re the resilience authority of Charles County. Um, and what's really interesting about that is it provides some capability that the county government didn't have by itself. Uh, one thing in particular, I, I think is a really great um, opportunity for, for counties is that when you have an organization like this, um, it, is, it's, it has its own bonding authority, right? County governments, we have uh, debt limits, debt ceilings, right? We can only have so much debt per, per our county policy. Um, if the Resilience Authority, as an ally, government instrumentality, goes out to the bond market and borrows money for a resilience project, that does not count against the county's debt ceiling. So you're no longer competing with roads or schools or other important public projects for what dollars are left underneath the, the county's debt ceiling. That's a pretty important financial consideration and frees up funds for resilience projects. Another thing that is an advantage is that nonprofit organizations can go out and apply for foundation grants that county governments can't. When you look at the rules of some of these places or some of these funds, they don't really want to give to county governments so much, but they're delighted to give to nonprofit community groups. And that's, you know, that's the definition of our resilience authority. Um, thirdly, and this is a little wonkish, but it can have its own procurement rules. Uh, you don't have to follow the county's procurement rules, which can sometimes be a little cumbersome. Um, you still want to get the best price and the best service, but it can go a lot quicker um, if you set up your own procurement rules. And, and lastly, and one that I, I, I didn't want to write last uh, because it, uh, to me, it's one of the most important ones. When I saw a slide earlier in that first panel discussion, it talked about the different kinds of capital there are, right? I think Johnny showed the slide. And it uh, talked about human capital as an asset, right? 
Well, most county governments are limited in the capacity that they have. They only have so many employees. They only have so much experience. Um, their county elected officials are focused on certain things and not others. But when you have a nonprofit organization as an ally that you created, you can populate its board of directors with experts. And that's one of the things we did in Charles County. We went out and got not just people from Charles County to be on the board, but we got folks from across the state. We got, you know, the one of the folks involved is a leader at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Um, we've got someone who's involved in finance um, from the, another large county's um, Green Bank. Um, I've got in, folks who do envir environmental work, um, Sierra Club people, uh, folks who focus on stormwater, um, a really eclectic, powerful group that has made this nonprofit organization the center of climate change thought and discussion in our community um, and really raised its level of visibility um, for the for our citizens. So I just throw that out there as an organizational innovation that I think is serving us very well. Hey, good morning. My name is Tom Murray, and I work with W.K. Dixon, which is a southeast uh, regional consulting firm. I've spent over 20 years uh, working uh, essentially in stormwater management, uh, assisting uh, municipal and, and counties, uh, local communities, uh, with their with their stormwater needs uh, throughout the throughout the southeast. So piggybacking a little bit on what Keith said, you know, one of uh, one of the areas that we see, you know, certainly funding community infrastructure is the is the stormwater utility. Uh, we've seen that uh, grow, particularly uh, for MS4 communities, is becoming uh, almost uh, almost commonplace for MS4 communities to have a stormwater utility. Uh, but we're even seeing non-MS4 communities, smaller communities, start to evaluate uh, a stormwater utility and whether it, whether it meets, uh, meets their needs or, or not. Uh, within those utilities, you know, one way that we've seen projects get funded is uh, leveraging uh, those fees uh, to tap into some of the external funding opportunities that we talked about in the first session. Um, uh, low interest SRF loans have become very popular for implementing projects that have nature-based solutions and, and green infrastructure. Uh, developing projects that merge uh, green and gray infrastructure and, and helping, again, leverage those, uh, those funds uh, to build uh, those projects into the, into the community. Uh, another area uh, that we've been uh, promoting and, and working with communities is especially those with stormwater utilities, sometimes these nature-based solutions get siloed within a stormwater utility where really they should be expanded uh, to the community as a whole. So how can we implement nature-based solutions throughout other departments? How can we collaborate uh, with other departments? You know, thinking about all infrastructure projects within your community, not focused just on stormwater management. So an example would be a downtown redevelopment streetscaping project. You know, that, those can generate a lot of interest within the community. Uh, they're seen as economic drivers. So how can we incorporate green infrastructure and nature-based solutions into those uh, into those areas. Uh, City of Myrtle Beach is currently uh, working on redeveloping their arts and innovation uh, district uh, where they are looking at significant uh, pervious parking uh, as part of that uh, as part of that district looking at GI retrofits within the within the streets as well. So how can we start to again build that throughout your throughout your community. Uh, working with water and sewer utilities more more closely. You know if you walk along a stream you're probably going to see a sanitary sewer line. Uh, and so in the past where you look at, uh, you start to see erosion closer and closer to the, to the sanitary sewer line. The old approach is just throwing some riprap and, and that's how you're going to protect the sanitary sewer line. How can we look at nature-based stream stabilization projects, uh, in-stream structures to, to redirect flows off the banks? And again, expanding, you're not just working in the stormwater utility environment, you're reaching out to other, uh, other uh, departments uh, within your community uh, community infrastructure. Great, and I'm Kate Schaefer. I'm in. Um, I work in the land conservation space uh, in our land trust community in South Carolina, um, specifically for the Open Land Trust in Beaufort. And we um, may have the enviable uh, position of actually having county funds available for land protection. Um, right now, we actually have two. Um, so our county has approved local funding um, via a property tax bond um, since 2002. 
Um, there have been five bond measures that have gone before Beaufort County voters to raise our property taxes for land protection. Um, and that can be fee simple acquisition for passive parks or conservation easements, which have a lot of um, benefit in terms of protecting the larger landscape. And then this, this past week or last week, whenever election day was, um, we approved $100 million in sales tax revenue um, to be collected over two, million, uh, two years for land protection, as did Charleston, or as did Dorchester County and as did Berkeley County, um, building on Charleston County's sales tax program. So you now have four counties in the state of South Carolina that will have land protection programs um, funding from their sales tax. You still have Beaufort that has funding from property tax. Greenville County appropriated some general funds and Oconee County does something funky with their water and sewer or soil and water conservation district. Um, but all of that to say um, it's a great opportunity and a gift from the voters to have funding available for land protection, but voter trust is a f fragile thing and spending this money well is is now our burden and opportunity. Um, and it's a great one because I think, um, you know, when we talk about all of these things, even the federal grants you heard from on the first panel, I guess our collective hope locally in Beaufort is that our local funding can be the most um, innovative and creative and flexible. It can help support local match a local match for state and federal fund funds, but it can also really address community needs. Um, and to date, it's been mostly on the conservation easement fee simple acquisition space um, because the voters have affirmed that land protection is a growth management tool. Um, it is a farmland preservation tool. It is a water quality preservation tool. I think what we'll start to see, and I think what we all need to start talking about, is that land protection is also a resilience tool and a sustainability tool. Because yes, we have these natural-based solutions to restore and improve where we have our built environment, but we also have land protection as an opportunity in our unbuilt environment that complements these nature-based solutions so, so well and is imperative when you consider the opportunity cost of not protecting the land up front in an area with rapid population growth. Um, so I know South Carolina, you know, having just required a resilience element in the comp plan, I guess my hope that I would manifest is that that can lead to more efforts in other counties, um, not just for um, nature-based solutions, but for these innovative local funds for land protection, for green infrastructure, for other things, because that is actually what led to the original Beaufort Fund in 2002 was the 1999 comp plan. And so these policy conversations that we're having in planning and zoning and in comprehensive planning conversations can lead to funding down the road, and I think we should seize that potential. Um, so Kate, okay, you just you sort of uh, made my segue to a question um, that I had prepared. So a lot of us in this space, we understand what land conservation is. It's, it's intuitive, right? We get it. We understand the benefits, of preservation, of protection, the recreation, the wildlife. We, we get all that. It's, it's really intuitive. So the con convincing uh, voters to support that is, is not too difficult. Right. For a stormwater utility, <laughs> um, folks trying to move water away, trying to make sure it's not too polluted when it gets to the open water, um, it isn't an easy sell. I mean, it, it's a harder sell, right? And then when we're trying to build in nature-based benefits with that stormwater infrastructure, people in Charleston, people in wherever, upstate, people doing buyouts that, that Eric is running, I mean, to say, well, we're gonna layer on top of this a nature-based approach so we get these other benefits. It's hard. So, so um, just talk about that a bit. Is it possible, or does Kate have the easiest job? <laughs> I don't think she has the easiest job. Uh, it is hard. One of the things about a, a, a stormwater fee is it's harder to explain to the general public than a, than a fee for electricity or gas or water, sewer, solid waste. Uh, it's been called a rain tax a lot of places I've worked over the years. Uh, I remember a long time ago, a citizen saying, I'd like to talk to somebody about how to get out of this watershed because it's nothing but trouble. <laughs> and it just kind of gave you an idea that if you're in the business, you know, you don't realize how foreign the concept is to a lot of folks. 
Uh, so education and outreach are really key. The other thing is there's a cost to implement and maintain a new fee for anything. I gotta decide what to charge people. I gotta change what I charge them if they change something. Mm -hmm. So with a stormwater fee, a pretty common rate structure is impervious area. And if you have to begin to know how much impervious area everybody has, you gotta spend some money to do that and keep up with that and figure out how to bill for it. So if you think about Beaufort County, Beaufort County, Beaufort, Port Royal, Bluffton, Hilton Head Island, they all have a stormwater fee too. Mm -hmm. And the county is the billing agent for that fee for places like Port Royal and Bluffton who are probably not big enough to have ever done a fee if they had to invent or buy and maintain their own billing system to build yet another fee. Mm -hmm. So there are some barriers to entry, but there's a lot of upside. One is that political will can vary over time for funding capital or O&M, and O&M might even be a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. We built this thing, but it's falling apart and nobody's taking care of it. That, that a fee that is a steady fee that you can plan for a long time allows you to run an operation as a government official a lot more efficiently than when you don't know what you're gonna get money for next year. Because as my dad was city engineer in Charlotte, he's dead now, uh, he said, the person I hate to fight with for money is the fire chief. <laughs> he's got a uniform, he's got a truck, he's got a Dalmatian, they've got a calendar, and we go toe to toe and we lose every time. I don't care if there hadn't been a fire in five years. So. You can, you, can, you can plan your O&M for a steady state revenue, whereas if you're running everything off a of general fund, you're gonna plan your O&M expenses for the trough. Right. You have to, so. Yeah. So, so just, so dig into a bit um, on the nature base, because we have stormwater management, and that's hard enough, right? As you just said, it's hard enough. Yeah. So on the but now we're trying to put yeah. now we're trying to put this green stuff on top of it, which a lot of people don't understand or don't well, care. One place to start is multi-use, multi-function, multi-outcome. Mm -hmm. So if you think about land conservation passed, and that was a bond referendum for sales tax or GO bonds, which means you got to get a vote of the people. You know, if you have revenue bonds, you don't have to have a vote. You just decide to sell them. You go to the marketplace and sell them. You raise rates to cover the revenue requirement. So I think what I see in a lot of places, somewhere I've worked a lot lately, is Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, they are debt financing GI that takes care of some of their stormwater challenges, provides some open space for citizens, and it reduces their sanitary sewer overflows. So there's an important kind of piece here that's not that common in the southeast, which is they have combined sewers. Less common in the southeast, we have newer water and sewer infrastructure, most places, not Charleston, but most places. And so the sewer lines are separate from the stormwater lines. In Pittsburgh, it's one pipe carrying both. So if I can divert and capture in green space, what I can do is I can shave the peak off of the flows in the sewer line and keep from having uh, sanitary sewer overflows into the river. Yeah, do you, anyone else comment on this sort of the challenge with yeah. stormwater infrastructure and layering the green into it? Well, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the barriers. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of the theme, uh, I think, of your, of your question. Um, you know, going back to the example of the resilience authority that I used, it was something very different. Um, I, I think our county was the first one in the state, um, and there's only two to date. <laughs> See how I got that in there, Joanna? First one in the state. Um, and uh, uh, so selling it, you know, what is this new thing? Who are you giving authority to? What authority are they going to have? Why is it called an authority? I don't know that I like it that we're not going to be electing people who have some authority to do something. Those are, those are great questions. Um, so what we did was tied the idea, the innovation, to a real problem, you know, that's the our elected officials had every day. Um, their single biggest problem, they would tell me, and do tell me frequently, is the flooding, community um, flooding problems. Um, Charles County is a very fast growing county, has been for the past couple of decades. In the 70s and 80s, a lot of um, communities were formed, and the county rules at the time were that when you 
put your infrastructure in and you build this community, Mr. Developer, you know, we'll take over the roads when you build them up to a certain standard. But that stormwater infrastructure, that's on the community. Um, so it's the community, your residents, the, the homeowners associations. And over the past 40, 50 years, you know, some have maintained them well and some not so well. You got a real, it runs the real gamut. Um, and so what, what we did was basically, we call it our big, hairy, audacious goal. And we decided we were going to take over as a county government over a long period of time these community storm drainage systems, starting with, you know, put the wall in priority. Um, and one of the things on the priority list that gets you higher up is if you use nature-based solutions and have um, a dual benefit. And usually with nature-based solutions, you can, you know, list several things that could be a, a dual benefit. In our case, we're on the Potomac River. Maryland has a... Um, obligation to the EPA to improve the health of Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so we can usually tie pollution abatement to our nature-based solutions and increase the point value for your community on getting higher up on the list for the county to take over your system. So tying the innovation and the idea to a real problem that the elected officials have is a way to get over the, the initial um, uh, reticence. Um, sure. Yes, one of the, one of the challenges uh, that we've uh, seen building building off of what has been said is the issue between public and, and private um, ownership, and a lot of stormwater utilities only operate in the right of way, or they, they only operate the, the public system, uh, and so then your 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 ability to to fund nature based solutions is limited to to within the within the right of way, uh, and of course you know a lot of the opportunities are on are on private property so you know a lot of times we'll meet with the community and we'll talk about prioritizing projects and even those that do work on private property uh, their first ask is what can we do on public property because as soon as you step on the private property everything gets more complicated uh, getting the easements and you know if you think about a stream project in an urban urban corridor you're not looking at one easement you're looking at 30 easements or, or the project may not be may not be viable uh, so that's that's one of the challenges we've started to see utilities look at maintaining um, any areas that carry public water. So as soon as the water runs off of a public street, even if it goes on the private property, the community may maintain that. Uh, but then, of course, it becomes more costly to maintain additional infrastructure. So that's always one of the issues that we're looking at when we're evaluating if a stormwater fee is appropriate. Uh, is looking at the the extent uh, of maintenance of that system. When you're looking at working within the right of way, City of Raleigh completed a study on on green infrastructure and how they could implement that into, especially into the right of way. And what they found was their development standards uh, were not supportive of actually green infrastructure uh, because looking at what is the required width of the roadway and what you know are sidewalks required on both sides of the street. And you start to chop up the right of way, and you see that there's there's very uh, little room for some from some GI practices. So they actually reevaluated their entire development standards to start to be able to promote more GI within the right of way. So that was a, an important component uh, as well. And again, you're working across departments uh, in that situation. And then one more uh, example of working across departmentally is, is really, uh, and it's been alluded to before, but maintenance of the system. Uh, so even communities that are very uh, proactive, uh, they may have a, a streets crew that maintains curb and gutter, closed pipe systems. That's what they do every day, and they don't have enough time to really take on any more at all. So the stormwater utility looks to the parks department, can you maintain GI? And they're like, well, we're not funded to maintain uh, GI. So a lot of these open practices uh, that are very visible to the community, uh, there's, there needs to be discussion internally about how they're going to be maintained uh, to make sure that they operate like they're supposed to and, like, and that they can be portrayed to the community as, as a benefit. Because uh, you don't want uh, these areas that are very visible to then become an eyesore or, or not be maintained uh, appropriately. And I'll just defend the stress and anxiety of land conservation for a little bit. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I think, you know, regardless whether you're talking about land conservation or stormwater um, infrastructure or, you know, a, a more creative approach, it, it comes down to communication and being able to 
tell a story and refer to a pilot project when you're talking about appealing to a voter or an elected official. Um, and so I'm, I'm thankful for all the smart people in this room that are engineers. Obviously, I am not one. Um, but if you if you talk to somebody about the engineering data, they may not be as excited as if you talk to them about an example project. And in Beaufort we, or in Port Royal, we have what's called the Cypress Wetlands, and it's just this kind of happy, charismatic place that people like, and it's a stormwater project. And I mean, people talk about it like my children's school walks there and it's just kind of like we, we all have these examples in our community and I think the more we can go back to it so when you're sitting down talking about stormwater Beaufort County and the elected officials are like oh is that going to be like the Cypress wetlands and if the engineers can say yes everyone's like great perfect um, and so we need more examples like that, right? And in the land conservation space, the challenge is also between public and private, but between public ownership and conservation easements on privately owned lands. And you know, protecting privately owned lands from a marsh migration perspective takes burden off of the public service in the future. Um, but you have to be able to explain that to people. And we have a really great public park that you can see the edge of the marsh and you can explain ecological succession and marsh migration if you're out there, but that happens on private land all the time. And so communicating, you know, getting someone hooked with that charismatic example and then communicating that that stuff happens at scale if it if land is privately protected or if you're integrating all of these things, I think is, um, is really important because um, the elected officials need to know uh, that, you know, they need to understand what the engineers are saying. Um, and and they also need to know that, you know, not all stormwater ponds are created equal, and here's why. People get very attached to their stormwater ponds, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and that, you know, bad, the, the location of development, even if it has the best stormwater standards, can still be inappropriate. Um, and, and that's a challenge as well when you think about how you layer and balance um, natural infrastructure and, and you know, low impact design in the wrong location from an ecosystem perspective. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Kate. I, I just used you as a foil to, to That's um, fine. To I don't do take it this. personally. <laughs> and um, so the, the issue you talk about, though, is scale. I mean, you just raise this issue of scale, mm -hmm. right? And the scale of a, of a big demonstration project or the scale of a system that you're developing that's connected, that has stackable benefits. That's, that's really easy when you're talking about big spaces, right? It's really hard. I mean, Tom just talked about what do you do on the streets and the parks and the stormwater department? Well, that is not at all a problem in Charleston. I mean, just I'm being flipped. It's a big problem in Charleston. We just don't have the space and the mm -hmm. and the skilled capacity to do some of this stuff. So we should, even if we create the space in our streets, as redevelop the city mm -hmm. over 50, 100 years, will we have the staff capacity to do it? It's a real challenge. I mean, I'll just I'll say this for those of you who don't know: the city stormwater department is funded for seven teams is funded for seven teams to do ditch maintenance. It's very important. Uh, overland drainage for the city. We have staffing for three. It's a real big problem. It's not just Charleston has this local government sort of staffing issue. It's around, but again, how do we solve this issue? But I'm going to come back to the issue of scale. So stormwater projects, stormwater management projects, flood risk mitigation projects, and water quality projects, they tend to work at a particular boundaries around them, right? That's your boundary condition for the project and it has to perform for this way for this output. And they're scored, they're developed and scored that way, right? But we know with nature-based features, the bigger the sort of the catchment, the bigger the floodplain, the bigger the area, your project boundary, the more stackable the benefits come. So how do we, as we think about the implementation of nature-based features or green infrastructure in our cities and our urban environments, how do we how do we manage that problem of scale versus impact and performance? I think we ought to start on this end this time. Okay. <laughs> sure. I can I can jump in and, and talk a little bit about scale. You know, a lot of a lot of what we're trying to do at the you know at the GI level is to intercept water you know where where it falls to the extent possible. Uh, and but when you do that, you are looking at a at a smaller scale. You're looking at um, private property uh, you know impacts and and how can we mitigate. Uh, runoff at that at that level, and um, and then how do we maintain uh, those sources? So, uh, some communities that we that we work with do have programs, uh, cost shares with private property owners, 
uh, to install uh, uh, green infrastructure at the at the very individual lot level, which could be a rain garden, it could be a rain rain spout disconnect, it could be a a, a rain barrel. Uh, typically, those communities are doing it because they have some type of impairment or nutrient sensitive water that they're trying to uh, that they're trying to address. So, City of Durham would be. Uh, an example where they are, they have a rain catchers program and they're looking at rain spout disconnects and just at a very small localized level. Um, having some type of, uh, you know, understanding how that gets maintained though uh, is, is obviously challenging because it really needs to happen at the private property level uh, at, that, uh, at that point. Um, as you start to move downstream into larger, larger scale projects, uh, one area that has been somewhat successful, uh, even if you can't do stream restoration, has been floodplain you know, reconnection projects, uh, allowing the, the floodwaters to more easily access uh, the floodplain that may have been impacted over time if you have the space. Uh, one of the barriers or the, the issues with some of those projects has been that the tree canopy has grown up in these areas, so you might have a great uh, project location uh, that, is, that is forested. And so then you have to look at you know, what are the impacts of, of, of taking down mature trees and then growing, growing smaller trees just to get that, that floodplain uh, capacity. So that's, uh, you know, you start to look at, you know, what is the carbon uh, cost over, you know, when do you get carbon neutral? Is it 30 years? Is it, is it 50 years? And, and that can be very, very challenging um, to, to implement, to communicate. Uh, and to really get the community to understand that they're not going to be there in 50 years, you know, so they're, they're worried about impacts to their community today. I'll take a stab at that okay, one too. Um, so uh, in Charles County, we were talking, we were talking earlier about these hundred neighborhoods. Um, Maryland is, is kind of blessed. Um, I think I'm from Maryland. It's kind of blessed among states in that um, we have a, a, a really great, uh, uh, land preservation program called Program Open Space. Um, and as a result of that, we have a lot of parcels of preserved land um, in every county, and Charles County is no different. I got, you know, four state parks, uh, a list as long as my arm of, of county parks. Um, uh, our, our county has, uh, the predominant land feature is forest still, um, and so we're excited about that. But it gives us an opportunity when neighborhood projects come up Sometimes they are adjacent to public owned land and you can combine the two um, and work with the local community, you know, with the public land to accomplish a, a, a stormwater issue. Um, uh, there, are, there are several examples of that where um, not only stormwater, but uh, drinking water and uh, wastewater. Um, can you, you need a place for an outfall for your system? Well, maybe the public land could be that, and it, through biological nutrient removal before it gets into the water, you know, you can remove the nutrients and the pollution from it. So there's a lot of ways you can combine that. Another thing I think is, is good to look at is kind of change your perspective on the small project. So in, in my county, we have a, hundreds of miles of shoreline along the Potomac and the Patuxent Rivers, and a goal is to restore uh, do stream restoration on a certain percentage of the, the shoreline, right? So maybe you don't have the data to show or you don't have the, um, the enough of the quantitative benefit to show on a certain project by itself, but you need it to get to a bigger goal of accomplishing a certain percentage of restoration along the particular tributary. Um, and so that in itself becomes a reason to do the project, not its own separate individual cost-benefit analysis, but the fact that it gets you toward that larger goal. So it changes your perspective on how you look at a project when you look at it that way. Great. And let me just add one thing. It's fun to go last. Um, that the, the, just to kind of build on what Mark just said, that the sum of the parts might be greater than the whole in some cases as you try to build toward something. When you think about how to finance these activities, one of the advantages of fee funding is that you can design the rate structure to encourage the thing that you want. So if you tax fund a program, property that has a value is going to pay for part of the cost of the program, even if that property is really a part of the solution mm -hmm. because they're undeveloped or because they're a low-lying area that provides depression storage when it rains, like in New Orleans. Uh, and you can establish credit and incentive programs that go with the fee that encourage 
uh, certain types of redevelopment, small GI projects up in the watershed, which can be really effective sometimes. And those are things that are hard to do with other kinds of funding. They do add complexity too, though. And so that's kind of the, the, mount, the counterpoint to it. Thank you. So what questions does the, yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Is, is there a Maryland? Is there a state law in Maryland that allows that authority to develop? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly the. That's exactly what I was going to. How I was going to answer it. Um, so great question, great comment. Um, right. That, that's the answer right there. So in, in Maryland, and I guess every state, you know, there's a state constitution, and your counties have certain authorities, things they can do, and things they can't do. In Maryland, up until two years ago, I think there would there was not the ability of counties to do resilience authorities. Um, and uh, that's when um, Anne Arundel County, where you're from, Tom, uh, and uh, with the help of Joanne Thoreau and Throw Environmental, um, you know, just worked on with state senators and local uh, elected officials and put in a, uh, a bill, Senate Bill 457, I think it was, uh, that created the ability, it was a um, enabling legislation that allowed counties to create resilience authorities. And one thing that hasn't played out about that that yet, which I really would like to see, is that um, a resilience authority for a county certainly can do projects within its own county, but it's not limited to that. It can do projects for neighboring counties or counties across the state somewhere else, or maybe even in another state. Um, so that's a really neat um, opportunity, I think, for jurisdictions that don't have a resilience authority to work with an existing resilience authority somewhere to get a project done. Thanks. So I would propose that Mark and Eric have a conversation just as a, just as a matter of uh, stay. There you go. Good. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes, Kim. Uh, yes, there, there can be both. Usually most of the uh, incentivizing, and Keith can correct me if I'm wrong, the credits are... You're wrong. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, ...for uh, non-residential uh, owners, uh, typically. I think on uh, the, the elements that I was speaking to, most of it is uh, more of a cost share uh, program. Uh, and But it's, it's a... The, 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 Community is going out to the to the or the, the county or the city is going out to the public and really uh, encouraging these types of activities. They'll have you know rain barrels that are you know for conservation at a very low cost. Uh, working with uh, residents to install rain gardens and bearing some of that cost, but usually there is still some cost on the individual uh, private private residents. Uh, I think the downspout disconnects, I mean, that's, that's obviously a little bit more low cost option that uh, it's a lot of that's just from an educational uh, standpoint. But they're having to look at these measures to meet their, their nutrient rules and trying to find ways to get as much credit as they can uh, at that very individual private property owner level. Sure. Yes, please. I can give a quick um, answer to that question in that um, the TNC resilience uh, map layer, I forget the official name that y'all call it, um, is actually embedded into our land protection priority map at the county and at the um, regional level. 
So that's helpful when we see what areas have been identified as marsh migration corridors. They essentially get higher priority in what we call our green print map. And that helps direct, or it helps give the, the data to advocate for conservation funds to be spent in that space. Yeah, if I can uh, touch on that one too, it's a great question. Um, I can't say I have an example of something that's worked, but I have an example of something that's on its way to working, I, I think. And, and, and it was really interesting to me um, when a group of students from one of our Maryland colleges came in and wanted to do a project in an area called Waldorf, Maryland, which is in my county. It's a more built up, a uh, lot of impervious surface, so runoff's a real problem. Um, and they wanted to do a study of uh, stormwater management and to make sure that the code that said what you had to plan for regarding the volume of water and the speed of the water that it goes through the, you know, the, the community is the correct numbers. And they took data from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science and, and you know, worked with scientists there to kind of come up with, with uh, their, their hypothesis and, and, uh, and they came out with a conclusion that no, we aren't planning for well enough for the, what the volume of water that we're gonna see. And so we're talking about changing what those requirements are. I can't say we've changed them yet, but I really like the innovation of the young people at the school coming and saying, we think this is a problem and we think there's a way to you know, analyze it and quantify it and show you what the real numbers and planning ought to be instead of what it really is. So that's, that was pretty cool to me. For the communities that we work, a, a, it depends on the individual community and, and obviously what their, what their goals and, and resources are. Uh, one area that we have looked a lot at that most watershed planning will look at uh, future build out conditions. Uh, and typically most of the communities we work with take a fairly conservative uh, approach. So they are evaluating uh, from, a, from a future condition standpoint. I think from the climate uh, resiliency standpoint, what we see more frequently, rather, rather than spending um, trying to forecast what those rainfall curves are going to be, is just looking at a higher level of service. So if, if the community currently requires a 10-year level of service, looking at what the additional cost would be and maybe designing for a 25-year level of service or, or maybe a 50-year uh, level of service. We have started seeing communities evaluate the current rainfall data, look at adjusting uh, their curves and adjusting their, their design standards. But when we look more from a watershed planning retrofit standpoint, that's one of the you know, more cost efficient ways to really evaluate how we're gonna be able to uh, increase the capacity of the system. And I, I'll just say I'm a recovering engineer, so <laughs> I probably don't have as good an opinion as Tom, but, but but the observation I would make is most everywhere we work seeks to slow the rate of degradation rather than make things better if you get right down to the bottom of it. And if you think about gray infrastructure and just wanted to say, well, it has a 100-year life, which is a long life, and you looked at the value of all the built stuff and divided by 100 and said, I would need to spend at least that in the simplest terms to keep up, Nobody does. So the, uh, my advisor at NC State said, when you're getting wet, there are three things you can do. The first thing you can do is move the water away from you. The second thing you can do is learn to live with it. And the third thing you can do is move away from the water. And the first two don't work. So what we really need to do is 
get out of the way. And that's hard because a lot of stuff's already built. So it's the perennial challenge. Uh, and, you know, for many, many years, the FEMA maps were the gospel, but they were designed to set insurance rates. And they were required to look to the past or at least not look to the future in establishing where the water was going to be for the explicit purpose of helping to set insurance rates. So... You know, we're a long way from where we need to be on these things, I think. Yeah, NC State is doing a fine job moving the water out of North Carolina. Well, it's straight down the hill. Instead of buying land in South Carolina. Water, water everywhere, yeah. Uh, so, it, so my take on that would be, you know, developers aren't going to build anything that isn't something they have to do to spend the money on it, right? Um, and so eventually you need to get to a point where the new standard is what it needs to be. Um, and I'm sure South Carolina has something like Maryland has, and they've de Maryland's designated a, a, one of the colleges of the University of Maryland, Center for Environmental Science, um, as the state expert in climate change and the entity responsible for projecting climate change impact around the state. Everybody's usually focused on, you know, sea level rise. Uh, and in Maryland, we've got this land subsidence thing, which kind of doubles the impact of, of uh, sea level rise for us around the Chesapeake Bay. But it needs to look more at the more frequent and intense storm event aspect of climate change, which is the most significant impact, I think, in our state, really. Uh, and let the local jurisdictions know. I know they're thinking about this and working on it, but they aren't there yet either. But they recognize it's their job to do that. And once that happens, then local jurisdictions have a hat to hang on, you know, regarding changing the actual um, requirement for uh, throughput on the stormwater systems. So just an editorial comment. I think the two design sessions that are, um, let's, um, let's get Keith to come help us design things, right? So good. Um, and there, we have time for one more question. Joanne, did, yes. Okay. Um, quickly, Tom, I wonder, first of all, if you could talk a little bit more about the SRF, the State Revolving Loan Fund, and the opportunities to really enhance nature-based solutions through some of the changes that are happening with the EIL, and um, hopefully the IRA, if you can expand on that. Um, and also, Mark, before you leave the panel, I think it'd be great for you to mention the um, rating agencies. Sure, we have several uh, projects with nature-based solutions and green infrastructure that have been funded through SRF, uh, both in North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, so it's a, it's a great tool to get a low, uh, low interest loan and really be able to leverage um, your, your resources over a, over a longer period of time. So the city of Myrtle Beach has a wetland restoration project that they are currently uh, finishing design and permitting will start construction uh, early next year uh, that they received a SRF loan um, and I can't remember what the what the rate is but it is uh, especially low especially in today's standards um, in North Carolina we've uh, completed a few projects that really uh, merged green and gray infrastructure so it was really a gray infrastructure project and to uh, uh, capture some of this funding. Uh, we implemented a, a range of, of green infrastructure uh, uh, solutions uh, mm -hmm. across the entire project corridor, which included uh, constructed wetlands and uh, regenerative stormwater conveyance, uh, as well as some street level uh, uh, GI that really the, the SRF loan made the entire project uh, possible because it was a very large $30 million project uh, that the city would not have been able to complete uh, otherwise. Yes, um, thank you all so much um, for having me, and it was a pleasure to be with these very smart people up here um, talking about nature-based solutions, but I do have to scoot. Um, if you have any questions about land conservation funding and at, at the local level, I'll be happy to answer them um, and or connect you with folks in your communities that can, so thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, her uh, bio and everything is on the Nature-Based Exchange website, so we're good. Right. Thank you, Kate. I will just quickly answering um, Joanne's question. Um, so uh, in Charles County, we were very fortunate to have, you know, we enjoy a AAA bond rating from, you know, Fitch, Moody's, and, and Standard & Poor. And 
what I thought was really cool is that Standard & Poor for several years running now has pointed out our climate preparedness as reason for justifying renewing our AAA bond rate and you're reaffirming it. Um, they pointed out our partnerships with the University of Maryland and others. They point out our ability or our efforts to make a climate smart workforce by putting climate competency in, in certain job position, job descriptions, by getting people credentialed through the Climate Leadership Academy and getting initials after their name, climate change professionally, our real, real credential, we've got quite a few folks in that, in that um, situation. And all that, and, and being innovative enough to create a, a resilience authority, all that has prompted them to, you know, write in our justification for everybody to see that, hey, this, this county is looking forward. You know, they're, they're building projects for the climate of 50 years from now instead of the climate of 50 years ago. So they're a good risk uh, when, when they're trying to build infrastructure. And, and that's the reason we're going to give them a triple A. So that's a real tangible benefit for local jurisdictions to point to because that saves your citizens money when you want to do projects. If you have a triple A rating, you're going to get a lower interest rate on money to borrow to build things like nature-based solutions um, than you would if you had a double A or a single A. Right. Yeah, the bond ratings have really picked, uh, picked up their game on this in the last five or seven years. And uh, we know the folks in Miami are very worried every time um, that the bond raters try to rate some issuance that they're, that they're preparing. So, yeah. So let's give a round of applause to our great speakers. Um, tremendous amount of knowledge.